Production support for the weekly special is provided by... Smithville Communications, serving Southern Indiana with high-speed fiber gigabit internet for businesses, hospitals, and homes. Smithville Fiber Gigabit Technology, tap the power. IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. IU Credit Union, now offering mobile access to IU Credit Union accounts, helping account holders check balances, transfer funds, and pay bills through their mobile devices. Available through the IU Credit Union apps for iPhone and Droid. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you. There are so many extraordinary stories throughout Indiana found in unexpected places, and tonight we'll explore just a few of them. Travel to French Lick to explore the big top under the dome and get a sneak peek of our upcoming documentary about this amazing community. Welcome Jessica Nunemaker as she shares her favorite small town destinations. And welcome blues guitarist Elias McDermott Seif. Explore the Hoosier heartland like you've not seen before. It's all coming up right now on the weekly special. and welcome to the weekly special, I'm Erica Sagone. One of my favorite things about exploring Indiana is discovering new places that I've never seen and history I've never known. And tonight we're celebrating those unique gems across our state, starting with beautiful French Lick, Indiana. The historic atrium at the West Baden Springs Hotel has hosted glamorous celebrities and exotic guests, but none more exotic than the circus. Oh, the circus history of the area is so interesting. And it's very hidden right now. Ed Ballard was the man who controlled the gaming in the valley. And he was a very shrewd business person. He owned a lot of property, and at any given time, he was worth between 20 and $100 million, which is a staggering sum back then. He made great investments. One of the investments was a circus. As a small boy, he was so poor that he couldn't even afford to go to the circus. But he had the opportunity in 1913 to buy one. In Peru, Indiana, there was a circus called the Hagenbeck Wallace Circus. It was started by a man named Ben Wallace. Later on, he joined with Carl Hagenbeck, who was an animal trainer from Germany. And the circus had people acts and animal acts. In 1913, there was a horrible flood, the Mississippi River and the Wabash flooded, and the circus grounds were so flooded that even elephants drowned. It decimated the circus. Well, Ed Ballard stepped in about that time and probably made a good business deal and bought that circus. His idea was, I'm bringing it down to French Lick and we're going to have it winter here. By 1915, he had buildings built just almost in the front yard of his house. He wanted to be able to walk out his front door, go right to the circus ground, see the animals, and the, everything that he couldn't do when he was a boy. There are a few old timers here who still remember elephants walking down the street. The first time the circus was in town, Lee Sinclair let them set the circus tents up on the old golf course, which is just right by the arches that enter in. During World War I, however, when this was an army hospital at West Baden, uh, they did have a performance inside the atrium. They would do a dress rehearsal performance in April for the community, hop on a train, and you would not see them again until the first week of November. And these circuses traveled by rail, which meant they could do a town a day, and that's exactly what they did. They moved every single day. Day and night, the circus moved like an efficient military unit along the rail lines, until a tragic night in 1918. An exhausted train engineer fell asleep in transit, ramming his locomotive into the back of the circus train. 
an estimated 80 people were killed and 120 injured in total, nearly half of the troop. That today is known in circus circles as the great train wreck. You say those three words, everybody knows what you mean. And it still is the largest loss of circus life of any accident for any circus going. That caused Ed Ballard to ante up something like $300,000 to help take care of things. And no different from today, yes, there were little lawsuits, all sorts of things like that happened. But the real devastation was, how does this circus continue on? Within three days after the accident, they did perform again in Beloit, Wisconsin, and other circuses sent people to help. That, that's what made the difference. The circus did bounce back. In the 1920s, the circus experienced a golden age, and within the decade, Ballard and his partners owned every single American circus but one, Ringling Brothers. In 1929, they thought, well, we own five circuses. Let's see if we can buy Ringling. The three partners sat with John Ringling. Two of the partners wanted to buy, the other one didn't. But there was a discussion, and the upshot of the deal was the gentleman sold out to the Ringling Circus for, I've read 1.7 million, I've read as high as 2 million. In 1929, six weeks later, the stock market crashes. Ballard was an extremely lucky business person that way. Once the circus sold to Ringling, it was the end of circus here. And that's today why you know Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus and you have never heard of Hagen Beck Wallace. Had that deal gone the other way, the words Ringling Brothers wouldn't mean anything. The French Lick and West Baden communities have fought to keep the town's circus history very much alive. And though the legacy has faded, they've been able to establish a new unexpected legacy for one of the largest circus dioramas in the world. This was built by a man in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia by the name of Peter Gorman. He intended to build the largest circus diorama in the country, so he picked the largest circus to build a diorama of, and that was Hagen Beck Wallace 1934. It was the largest circus that ever went out on the railroad. Peter spent 32 years building the diorama. He would go out take pictures of the wagons, of the railroad cars, of the performers, and draw up his own blueprints. His day job was a traveling job, so he would carry a briefcase full of balsa wood, basswood, and paint, and instead of sitting at the bars at night drinking, he would build models. In total, it took Peter 40 years to build. Today, the diorama features over 150,000 individual pieces, including 5,700 people and animal figures. Since the circus wintered here from 1913 to 22, he thought that French Lick and West Baden would be interested in his DRM, and we were. In the end, the diorama stretched an impressive 1,100 square feet. For 23 days, as many as 20 volunteers worked on the diorama, laying track and completing ground cover, including a very enthusiastic model train builder. Sure enough, I got a call on the 1st of January, 2013, and Peter Gorman came down from Vancouver. We started and we laid some track. I have experience as a model railroader, so I knew quite a bit about building the display. Didn't know a thing about circuses, and volunteered 432 hours and talked myself into a job. Don't miss the opportunity to see this amazing display for yourself. Learn more at the museum's website, flwbmuseum.com. And if you want to discover more about the history, natural beauty, and culture of Orange County, you don't want to miss our upcoming documentary about this remarkable community. Here's a sneak peek. For me, it's heritage. And that's part of the fun of living somewhere and knowing your past. You're building on that. The spirit of Orange County would be the spirit of hospitality, the spirit of welcoming people to our area, which they've done for now close to 150 years. I think the spirit of Orange County is its people, the people of this area, who genuinely care about one another as neighbors, and friends, and family. We talk a lot about the buildings and the history of different parts of the community, 
But at the end, we always talk about what really makes a community. And of course, the answer is the people is what makes the town. The spirit of Orange County is the people of Orange County. And be sure to tune in to WTIU on Monday, March 2nd at 8 p.m. for the premiere. Catch additional bonus videos from Spirit of Orange County at indianapublicmedia.org backslash spirit. And if there's anyone who knows how to find the spirit of a small town, it's Little Indiana's Jessica Nunemaker. <laughs> Jessica, welcome back to the studio. Thanks. It's, it's been a while. Yeah. It's good to get back in. It's great <laughs> to have you here. The thing that I love about the Little Indiana blog and the segments that you do for the weekly special is that you find the most interesting places as you zigzag the state. <laughs> how do you do it? Well, zigzag is one way to say it. Another is uh, I often get hopelessly lost and sort of bump into things. Um, <laughs> I love that, hopelessly lost. <laughs> Tell us, where have you gotten lost lately? Um, well, I've found a few great towns I can't wait to share. Uh, Fortville, Indiana, Mooresville, Martinsville, Greencastle. There's, there's so many great ones out there. You um, must be on the road quite a bit. Yeah, I, you know, I admit I, I slowed down a little bit because uh, I've been working on my book. Oh my gosh, a book. That's your <laughs> next adventure, and we can't wait to hear all about it. What can you tell us? Um, well, it uh, it's details everything to do in small towns, uh, just like the website, but it'll be just a handy guide that lets you know exactly what there is and what part of the state and, and just clue you in those things that you just you wouldn't know about otherwise. That's great. And so when can we expect to pick up that book? Uh, it will be released by Indiana University Press in early 2016, which is just in time for Indiana's big birthday celebration. Wonderful. <laughs> well, we've got a little bit of time to wait, but don't worry. You're going to be giving us ideas of small towns to explore <laughs> on the weekly special, and we really love that. How did you get the idea to start sort of exploring small Indiana towns? <laughs> well, <laughs> way back when um, I was doing freelance writing and social media for different companies and startups of all sizes. And I kept hearing, you need a blog, you need a blog, you need a blog, you need a blog. And I kept thinking, you know, it has to be something I'm really going to care about. And uh, I, I racked my brain and I couldn't come up with anything that I would actually stick with. Okay. Um, until the first December in our small town. Uh, and we, it was cold, dark, you know, the typical Indiana winter. And we started hearing sirens. And they just kept going and going. So my husband said, you know, I'm going to go out there, see if there's something that I can do because they sound really close. Okay. Well, he went outside. He came almost right back in and said, get your coats on. You aren't going to believe this, but there's a Christmas parade going on right down the street. <laughs> um, and that was I, just really two and a half blocks away from our home. We had no idea. And it got me thinking, if we didn't know, then how many other people didn't know? And that's really what planted the seed and, uh, and what maybe kind of develop this idea of, well, you know what, maybe someone needs to go out there and show what's in these towns and let other people know. Sure, and, and that was five years ago, and in that time, you've been to dozens and dozens of cities across Indiana. Mm -hmm. And speaking of trying to find those unexpected gems, let's take a look back at one of your visits, mm -hmm. one that's particularly relevant on tonight's show. <laughs> Your first stop should always be the County Museum. Here in Peru, it's easy to find. Located right downtown, the Miami County Museum contains two floors of artifacts and local history and makes the perfect introduction to this history-filled town. Put some quarters in the vintage orchestrion, admire or cringe at the stuffed two-headed calf, check out Cole Porter memorabilia, the circus everything, there's a lot to see. Enjoy one of the top 10 dress shops in Indiana if you step inside Lillian's Bridal and Prom Boutique. Is this lovely or what? There's also a 20-year-old music shop nearby, the Peru Music Center. Pianos, guitars, drums. It's absolutely amazing to see this kind of an assortment in a small town. I love it. I can't actually play any of it, but it sure is fun to see. If you are looking for breakfast or lunch, Café du Cirque is a cozy and warm establishment. Just off the downtown, this mom and pop strives to use locally grown produce and ingredients. They make the most gorgeous salads, fantastic panini, and offer only organic, fair trade, shade grown coffee. The free Wi-Fi at Café du Cirque makes it easy to linger. When the dinner hour approaches, look for the train cars. 
The siding takes its name from an old railroad term. And here at this unusual restaurant, you will find two dining railroad cars. Although not always available to sit inside, the weekend prime rib evening buffet with lovely and delicious homemade desserts certainly makes this unique. Heading away from town lies McClure's Orchard and Winery. A family-run farm, make it a point to try the hard cider. They've got flavors that range from jalapeno, which isn't too bad actually, to my personal favorite, bonbon. They also produce their own wine, have an on-site cafe with homemade apple dumplings, and a petting zoo complete with horse rides, season permitting. Well, Jessica, that was such a neat look at Peru. I really enjoyed it. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you think people find fascinating about small Indiana towns. Well, it's, it's always a different experience. I mean, you could go visit a big box place and it will be the same experience every single time you go. But when you go to these small towns, you never know what to expect. I mean, you, you eat at a restaurant and you can chit chat with the people that work there that also most likely own it. I mean, there's, there's just, there's always something different to find. Um, and thanks, thanks to the site now, anyone can find it easily without having to worry about getting lost. Yeah, and I'm sure there's <laughs> dozens of places on your list to go to. We can't wait to see them all. And of course, you can follow all of Jessica's latest adventures at her website, littleindiana.com. Again, Jessica, thanks so much for being on the show. <laughs> well, talk about a lot of spirit in an unexpected place. Our next musician may be young, but he's already impressing people with his soulful blues. I would say my interest in music began when I was about five years old and I started taking piano lessons and it gradually came to the point when I was 10 and I started taking guitar lessons. When I would see guitar players play on PBS or on YouTube, that was always a great thing. It was just an instrument that you could really express yourself on. I fell in love with it with all of the different types of guitars, amps and effects. I would say my genre right now is kind of blues rock but I do like to play a lot of jazz too. I find jazz really compelling. There's this saying that there are no wrong notes in jazz. There's just such a definite sound with the different players you're listening to and just how everything comes together, the horns, the rhythm section. I would say the blues is a lot simpler than jazz is studied. Many blues songs sound the same. It's just different players that can kind of recreate that sound to make it more unique. I would say my age definitely impacts the way I play music. When I'm playing blues at different places around town, people upon first glance would ask themselves, does this 16 year old kid does even know what he's talking about? Can he really play the blues? And I know it is based on years of experience and years of having events happen in life, but also on that level of music too. I put a lot of time and in listening into the greats like Steve Ray Vaughan, B.B. King, to just really become more comfortable with how the blues works. When I'm performing, the aspect that I personally enjoy the most is when the crowd is able to understand and see what exactly is happening in the piece with the music, whether it's, I mean, after a solo or something happens with the tempo, or generally they're able to feel what we're feeling on stage. They're just really aware of what's going on and how the music is taken off. I hope they are able to understand where I'm coming from, trying to play music that maybe it's not really meant for me that I'm kind of trying my best to gain all these years of experience by playing shows so I can have a much easier time in the future to make sure that I'm completely 100% knowledgeable about what I'm doing. The main thing that I'm most excited about and looking forward to after high school is no matter whether I'm in college or I'm playing the shows, is that I'm still able to play music at the level I'm playing it now. And now, Elias McDermott site.
Cause everything is going well As long as I got my guitar in hand It's easy to tell I mean everything is in my control I'm not gonna let no words swallow me whole Clocks keep ticking You can listen to more of Elias's music at his Reverb Nation page. And be sure to check out our website for bonus videos, plus catch up on any little Indianas you might have missed. And don't be afraid to get out and discover all those great Hoosier stories right in your backyard. Thanks so much for joining us. And once again, before we go, Elias McDermott Sipe.
Production support for the weekly special is provided by Smithville Communications, serving southern Indiana with high-speed fiber gigabit internet for businesses, hospitals and homes. Smithville Fiber Gigabit Technology. Tap the power. IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. IU Credit Union, now offering mobile access to IU Credit Union accounts, helping account holders check balances, transfer funds, and pay bills through their mobile devices. Available through the IU Credit Union apps for iPhone and Droid. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you 